Hello and welcome to the Artists Make Money podcast, where artists share their money thoughts, fears and dreams. I'm your host, Vivian Egan. I'm an interactive theatre and comedy producer, a podcaster and a freelance business writer. And I'm also a complete busybody who wants to change the conversation when it comes to money and the arts, one person at a time. This week's guest is actor and real estate auctioneer and entrepreneur, Oliver Burton. Ollie's an old friend of mine from university who later trained at NIDA, Australia's top acting and theatre school. I really, really appreciated how honest he was about having to weigh his acting ambitions with other life goals, talking about his privilege and his feelings about being a straight white guy in theatre right now, about discovering ADHD as an adult and lots more besides. He also told me about how he's using his acting skills to create a whole other business, so you should definitely listen to this one. This episode of Artists Make Money is brought to you by our friends at Side Hustle Sites. They make designer flat pack websites, like the IKEA of websites, uh, with helpful instructions and guides for how to make your website look really great. It is cheaper than Squarespace and their templates are actually specialized to particular jobs. So they've got templates for theater professionals and for freelance writers. I'm actually about to use them to build my freelance writing website because I don't have one. Or they can actually design you a website from scratch, which they did for me on the Artists Make Money website. If you sign up via sidehustle-sites.com slash AMM, I will link that in the show notes, you will get a fantastic professional looking website and your first month subscription free and the second month half price. That is just for Artists Make Money listeners. On with the show. Oliver, welcome to the Artists Make Money podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Uh, uh, thank you, Viv. It's very nice to be here. I'm um, honoured to be asked. Um, I'm I'm tired. I've um, been working hard, but uh, but I'm good. It's uh, it's a bit after eight here. So uh, uh, are you a morning person? I'm not a morning person. So no, uh, probably evening is better. But no. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, it's the person of the time zone. Um, so will you tell the people first off uh, what you do and how you make money? Sure. Um, okay. Uh, well, at the moment, um, I guess my my day job and my side hustle have sort of flipped. Um, so, uh, I've, you know, for the last five years, no, um, well, I graduated from drama school uh, in the end of 2015. Let's start there and define myself as a professional actor um, for, for quite some time. I think um, it's only probably recently that, that I think the, the literal definition of what I do is that I'm in real estate, um, doing a couple of different things there. Uh, and the acting has flipped to the side hustle rather than you know where I began, which was that um, real estate was supposed to be the side hustle that kept me acting. So uh, perhaps you might want to dig into that a little bit as we go, but uh, I'm, what I do is, uh, as my day jobs, my money job, um, two things. Uh, I'm an auctioneer um, uh, for real estate, which I believe in the UK is, is a fairly rare kind of occurrence. Yes, I did want to explain to any of my UK listeners how, uh, so most most uh, properties in, in Australia, at least in Sydney, where Ollie and I are from, are sold by public auction and uh so anyone can show up and it's kind of like uh, a sydney-wide pastime on a saturday afternoon where you're like oh the house around the corner is up for auction do you want to yeah let's have a look let's just, just go and have a look um and so it's kind of like a very public affair that's held like in the front yard of the house or on the street so it often draws a bit of a crowd um yeah yeah and I can imagine um, some of your English listeners cr- like cringing at the, the, the sheer thought of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it's, it's got a number of advantages. Um, one of them is transparency. Uh, and I won't give you, give you too much real estate chat because I know it's not the purpose here. But, but it's, it's the fact that you turn up to bid at an auction and you can see what the other offer is. Mm-hmm. So it takes that, that kind of sense that the real estate agent might be playing you for a fool a bit out of the equation. You know that somebody's just offered $1,500,000 to the property. So 
you're going to have to offer more than that or you're not going to win it. Um, so that's the sort of the advantage, you know, for the seller's advantage, it's, and this is where I come in, my job is to essentially do street theatre, is to uh, create atmosphere, create emotion, create you know, using storytelling to create some kind of engagement for the crowd uh, in order to theoretically maximize the result for the person selling the property um, and, and make sure that, that every last dollar that could possibly have been put on the table has been done so. So that's the kind of the two sides of the coin. Yes, and I have seen videos of you doing it and you're very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> so would you like to tell people how it was that you, like what made you think of this as a side hustle, how you got there, you know, so on? Sure. So um, coming out of drama school, um, I it was one of those simple things. I saw a bloke calling one at a couple of apartment blocks down from where I was. Uh, yeah. And I thought, oh, I can do that. Um, it's performance, right? Um, the numbers were never going to be my strong suit. Um, I didn't, didn't get very far in maths at school, but um, uh, it's basically just adding up. I don't have to do any other complicated stuff. I need it as long as you can sort of recognize the patterns of the numbers and, and practice and text practice. Five. So sorry. So, say again? Usually in tens and fives, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, depends on how difficult people want to be with you. Um, but you, ha you have to, you know, if somebody's going to throw you sevens and two and a halfs and, and fifteens and whatever just to muck around with you, which they do sometimes, um, you, you know, you want to be pretty sharp with your responses. Um, where was I? So uh, I saw a guy calling this option and I thought, well, that's a very good idea because what I need is a job that doesn't take me away from acting, that pays very well by the hour, and that is, you know, principally um, conducted on a Saturday and that uses my existing skills. And I went, well, Thanks. this is, that's, yeah, perfect. And people say, well, it's either that or marriage celibacy. And, and I, don't, uh, I don't, you know, I've never really understood marriage particularly as a, the concept. So um, the, <laughs> the auctioneering seemed to make more sense. So um, I, what you need to have is a real estate license. And in fact, um, in New South Wales, you have to have the top class of real estate license. It's called a class one. So at the time that I did that, that was not as hard to attain as it is now and probably not as hard to attain as you would have hoped it would have been. So to get your certificate of registration in New South Wales, you need to do five days in a classroom. To then get your license, which allowed you to run a branch of a real estate agency. I mean, you know, to be a, a top person was another eight days in a classroom spread over a few months. Okay. And you and I spent a lot of time learning philosophy and, and you know, and things in arts degrees, which are <laughs> a lot less consequential, perhaps, mm -hmm. arguably, I guess, than to people in uh, millions of dollars of sales. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, so I got that license, um, sort of speculating that I'd be able to find a way into this business. And um, my way in ended up being winning uh, the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales, um, their auction, novice auctioneering competition. Um, and so that was there were a number of heats and a final and, and I managed to win that. Um, and from there, I was offered a job at a, a terrific company called Cooley Auctions and um, so the rest is history. So I've continued to, uh, to call auctions for them for the, the last few years. Um, also in the last few months, uh, not sure if you're aware of this actually, Viv, um, I've opened up uh, a buyer's agency. So I'm also a buyer's agent now, which again is another concept that I'm not sure how many UK people would necessarily be aware of. But the idea is that uh, there's always a selling agent who's there representing the best interests of the vendor and concentrated and professional and knows what they're doing and, and unfortunately a lot of buyers are having to do this in their spare time for the first time perhaps um, and they're not going to have access to all the properties that are out there and not going to you know be able to get the best result through negotiation or auction or whatever it is so my job then is to to find those people to work out what they want to buy how much they've got to spend and try and make it happen yes i i have actually seen that on facebook um hmm. it looks very entrepreneurial um so, so between those two kind of real estate jobs, um, how are you, how are you going with your acting career? Well, um, real estate is a six day a week job. And on the seventh day at the moment, um, I am in a play, I'm, which believe it or not is Glengarry Glen Ross, which is about real estate agents. <laughs> so for God's sake, even when I'm doing creative stuff, I still can't escape it. Um, but it sort of works. So, um, if people remember the film with um, Al Pacino and um, uh, Alec Baldwin and, and all those, and Jack Lemmon, uh, always be closing second prizes and set of steak knives, third prizes, you're fucking fired, that one, that script. So um, I'm doing that. I'm playing Al Pacino. Um, so uh, Jude Boy over here is uh, putting on his best Italian and no, I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah it's great so we're doing, doing that at the new theater which is a lovely stage and it's a, it's a really terrific cast and um you're working hard viv <laughs> working hard but um fun. enjoying it it sounds yeah. fun and you've just moved house 
and just moved house as well. Yeah. It's surrounded by boxes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it's um, yeah, it's it's all happening really. I suppose um the the buying stuff has come about in the you know in the last six months or so. Um, I, I'm sure for everybody and, and for you guys in the UK and in the US and other parts of the world, it's the pandemic is far more impactful than it has been in Australia. We've been unbelievably lucky um, with the way we've we've sort of got away with it more or less, touch wood for now. Um, but it was clarifying, you know, you, you, I got to the sort of midpoint of, of the worst of our kind of um, economic and, and um, uh, sort of social impacts of it in, in the middle of the last year and, and thought, right, well, there's not going to be much of an arts industry left um, very much in the next few years, certainly not in theatre, mm -hmm. and even the stuff that, that might still be around has probably got a backlog of stuff that was cast already last year, so I haven't really got anything on the horizon, so that this seems a bit silly. And and um, you know, and then the auctioneering. Um, to be honest, you know, this is a little bit of inside baseball. People would assume that the auctioneer is also on a percentage, like of the sale price, like the uh, agent would be. They're not. We're on a fee, um, and that fee is very generous per hour. You know, if you sort of say, well, it could only take twenty minutes, and, and my fee might be, you know, a, a sort of healthy split of seven hundred dollars. But um, you've got to work through the whole rest of the week in order to, to keep winning those clients and making sure the whole thing happens. So. All of that to say that I thought, well, if it's, I'm 32, if it's, or I was about to be at that point, if it's time to make a decision to do something else, um, I got to work out what that is going to be. Um, and uh, I have. I have aspirations towards a comfortable lifestyle. I mean, I, you know, I'm selling multi-million dollar property every weekend and I'm, I'm you know, it, it rubs off on you after a while. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but uh, more modest aspirations and that sort of thing. But but I suppose the point is that um, I always wanted to be an actor, first and foremost, uh, and, a, and a, a storytelling creative person. Um, and, but I didn't want to be destitute to do that. <laughs> And so uh, the auctioneering was supposed to be a way for that to be the case. And in the end, um, I, I don't think that that alone was going to meet those goals. And um, certainly nobody's been clamoring to put me in any serious television series or, uh, or you know, or pay me anything um, dramatic in order to be dramatic. So uh, I've made a different choice mm. for now. So, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of... I'm quite in favour of these sort of pragmatic decision makings. Like, actually, you know, for me, that decision came sort of a lot earlier when I, you know, when I was through high school, I was like, I really like acting. And then I got to uni and I was like, I'm not even the best actor in our drama club that we met in, Ollie. I'm like, well, there's no way I'm going to, like, make it in the real world. Uh, and I tried a bunch of other things and I kind of, you know, I've, uh, sorry. <laughs> No, I was going to say it doesn't it doesn't seem to matter who the best actor is. That <laughs> seems to be largely irrelevant to casting things. Um, so I wouldn't have worried about that, even if that were true. But, um, <laughs> and I remember you being very good. Oh, that's um, fine. so um, yeah, because before all this, I uh, I worked at a company called Sport for Joe Theatre. Um, so I was very lucky to, well, yeah, I mean, I was lucky in the first instance that that um, to meet very early on uh, as a teenager a chap called Damien Ryan who ended up um, sort of revealing himself as, as it were um, kind of emerging as uh, the foremost or certainly one of the foremost um, Shakespeare directors in, in Australia um, and uh, a similar kind of thought process in a way that I, I looked around other kids had gone to drama school that, that I had been in a cohort with and thought well I'm not going to keep getting cast in things if I'm not training I was intent on going to study media at Sydney Uni which is where we met uh, and so I put up my hand to produce um, and, and Damien and I, you know, essentially began the company um, and it, it is still running to this day. I'm, I'm not um, involved uh, as a producer anymore, um, but, uh, you know, three years of, of doing that and building it, and including uh, outdoor Shakespeare in the Royal Botanic Gardens in the middle of Sydney, which was, was pretty cool. Um, you know, it, it, it taught me a lot. I was uh, in way of my head and uh and just paddled like crazy and we had a lot of help we made a lot of mistakes and um and after a while i realized that i couldn't sit adjacent to a rehearsal room anymore while people were in there you know laughing and, and mm. telling stories and, and making art and i was um on the phone to councils trying to um yeah. you know make shows run um and god almighty do i take my hats off to people who do that for a living and who love it and can do it continually um i got to a point where i was utterly paralyzed couldn't send an email anymore i was so um 
mm. sort of anxiety ridden and stressed by by doing that. Um, and so uh, that's when I applied for drama school and I managed to get in and um, I did that and trained for three years and, and, you know, we've done my timeline way back to Frontier, but, um, you know, those yeah. who playing the bingo card at home, that I think you've got all the pieces now. Yes. So I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that um, pragmatic decision about, so now you say you, you're spending most of your time at the moment doing this um, real estate thing. You've got, basically, you've got two different businesses, effectively, or a, a job in a business. And yep. it, does it conflict with your sense of yourself as an artist, given how much time you spend doing those other things? Yes, deeply. Mm. Um, and that has been, that's probably the most simple way of encapsulating the last six months. Um, I, I think I grew up, and as I think a lot of people do, um, and maybe, is it about our generation? I don't know. There was something specific about our generation, I think, where, where we were told that we could do whatever we wanted to do and, and dream whatever we wanted to dream and just to keep pursuing that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think somewhere along the line, that for me became your job is what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose what's, I suppose what I've managed to kind of come to is uh, a sense of autonomy and a sense of my own um, destiny, again, and being a bit more in control of that. Um, and so, and being able to see rewards ahead. I feel um, like I've worked as very, very hard as much as possible, um, you know, and trying to apply the, the sort of lessons of real estate, you know, in, in, in what we call prospecting, really trying to make connections, network, do whatever you have to do in order to get jobs in this business. And, and for whatever reason, at this point, it hasn't flown. Um, I, as an actor, um, to the extent that I require it to. And that's the point is that, you know, I, I'm not content with sacrificing everything for this. And yeah. I think that's, I think that's the difference because there are people who do mm. and, and can and will, um, you know, I, uh, I, I want to start a family. I, um, my, my partner of, um, you know, more than 10 years is a visual artist. You know, I could have ended up with a lawyer or a doctor. I didn't. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I, there's, there's, there comes a point where you say, okay, I can do one of these things now. Mm. Um, and you know, the, I get, I, I saw Derek Jacobi speak, um, when I was in London, um, some years ago mm. and, um, some, somebody asked him, you know, what advice do you, you know, do you have for a young actor? Um, and he, he said something to the effect of, you know, I, um, it's an incredibly difficult profession. Literally, if there is anything else that you can do to make you happy, you should do that instead. Yeah. Um, okay. and he said, if you really, well. if, <laughs> he said, if you really, 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 really want to be an actor, then you should, you know, consider all your other options because it's a, it's a horrible existence. If you really, really need to be an actor, you go to drama school. Mm. And that I thought was a useful distinction. Um, really? but I came out of drama school the way we all, all of us who get the privilege of training in a, in a conservatory institution like that, um, come out, which is with the belief that sooner or later probably sooner because you're, you're a brilliant little snowflake somebody's going to notice how bloody talented you are and it's going to you know give you a contract for a million dollars it's only a question of time um and you know uh <laughs> that, that that hasn't that hasn't happened yet you yeah. never say never um yeah. but in the meantime i realized there was a significant opportunity cost to sitting around and waiting Mm. Uh, and each day you, you know, was, was where there was time that could have been better filled. And, and look, you know, I, I did lots of weird things, um, MC gigs and corporate training and um, uh, hosting murder mystery parties. And, you you, I mean, you and drove just, Uber for a while, didn't you? I drove Uber for a while um, in the, in the grey zones of, you know, when it was semi-legal over here and, and there was a little bit more money to be made. And that was fascinating as a, as a creative, actually. We could talk about that as a separate thing, sort of things you pick up from people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, look, I did a whole lot of things. Um, to, to sort of make it work. Um, but at some point, you know, I didn't want to live like a student anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and it's also hard, Viv, and you probably, I'm sure you know this um, as well as anybody, that you're sitting around 
it's not that you're sitting around waiting for the phone to ring, but it's, but it's, you have to be constantly available because at any moment, the bloody audition will, will turn up and you've got to send, particularly now, you're sending a self tape, you've got to send up all the camera gear and send the bloody thing in. You, you can't go into audition with these things. Um, or the job turns up or you got to go on tour or what, whatever it is. Mm. And so you say no to stuff, to real life people, real normal people stuff, muggle stuff, mm. um, in order to be ready for when the chance comes. And for right now, I feel good doing what I'm doing. And I genuinely do. Um, and I, maybe I've been surprised myself saying this because I am working really hard um, in, in, you know, in, in both of these sort of parts of what I do in the real estate world. I feel like I'm good at it. I feel like it is a natural combination of the skills that I've sort of been born with and picked up. And there's proper money to be made. Mm. there is a lot to be said for all of those things like yeah feeling like you can do something well and that you have the opportunity to do it and that you're compensated for it I think isn't that that um that well I think there's the Japanese word like ikigai which is like the confluence of all the things that you're good at that someone is yeah someone will pay you for uh all that thing maybe yes. not Maybe not exactly. Maybe that would be if you were in the million dollar contract <laughs> and you were acting every day and that would be perfect. But, you know, it's pretty close. And like a lot of people don't get to do that in their lives. And, you know, you are certainly if you're making a business at the end of the day, you are creating something that wasn't there before. And yeah, and that is exciting as well. Yeah, it is. I, I never saw myself as as you know, kind of a small business person, like that, that never particularly excited me as I was growing up. Um, but I've ended up in a number of startups, you know, from, from sport for Jove, um, you know, into, into what I'm doing now with, with Lumen property buyers, um, and small businesses as well. And in fact, I was saying to a colleague of mine, as we were going around doing auctions today, been filming on a Saturday, so I'm still in work gear, <laughs> more or less. Um, uh, I said, you know, I've never, I've never done the corporate thing, I've barely even been in full-time work before now, mm. more or less. Um, that's not totally true, but I've never, I've never been in a, in a place with an HR department. So let's put it that way. Yeah. And so I have no idea what that culture is like. I don't know whether I'd like it. Maybe I would, but I, I, at this point, I don't have any intent on finding out because I'm, yeah. I'm planning to make this work instead. <laughs> anyway. oh, to be honest, Ollie, when, when we met, which was a long time ago now, <laughs> I, I think if, if you'd have had to have bet I think people probably would have said you you were more likely to end up in something like corporate or real estate um but you've kind of come around to it in this in this sort of circular way um and I think it's kind of quite emblematic of our generation you were saying before like I was reflecting the other day that I think I've had two permanent full-time jobs ever in my life and I ended one of them like 10 years ago nearly mm. so it's like I think we just kind of do piece together things and we get our um, get our money from certain places. We get our, you know, sense of purpose from maybe other places. Uh, and I think that's OK as long as you have the autonomy and as long as you have the, uh, you know, that you can have that comfortable life that you want if that's what you want. Hopefully sure. That's a well, you life. <laughs> Well, you, your point about identity that you were raising before is is a really interesting one, um, because I think it's here's one of the funny things. Like when you say to some, when somebody says, "What do you do?" and you say, "You're an actor," mm. you know that you dread the next question, which is, "Oh, great, what have I seen you in?" Which in my case is not a lot. Um, I don't know. It's an episode of Deadly Women, which is a, a crime reenactment show I've been on a couple of times. Um, I mean, you know, that's about it. But chances are you probably don't watch that. Um, and a couple of ads. Um, but um, so you dread that question. But, you know, it's a, it's still a conversation because um, it's something odd, you know, and, and different. And people don't meet professional actors or, or actors who are more than 25 years old, you know, all that often probably in their day-to-day -day lives and they you know and they want to know how you could possibly learn the lines it seems to be the thing that confuses people most of all but it's the <laughs> smallest part of this bizarre existence um so i got used to that which is that if i am what i do 
and what I do is interesting, therefore I am interesting. And that continued into being an auctioneer because even though real estate is a very ordinary kind of a job, um, you know, being an auctioneer, Mm. everybody's, well, I mean, everybody's heard of what that is, but you haven't met them. You, people talk to you as an auction, you know, when they, you tell somebody you're an auctioneer, they, they look at you like you've just said you're an astronaut. It's like, I understand the concept, but I didn't know anybody did that or I've never really talked to them about it. So again, it was an interesting job. Mm. And the idea of flipping into something, I mean, the, the buyers, you know, it, the buyer's agency, I, I guess it is slightly interesting to people in that it's, it's slightly unfamiliar, but generally speaking, I'm sliding towards an ordinary job mm. that is not necessarily the beginning of an interesting conversation for somebody. And to some extent, the question around identity is, am I therefore sliding towards being an ordinary person that is not interesting to somebody? And I know that's a very pretentious kind of thing to say, but again, special little actor Snowflake who went to NIDA, like, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a degree to which you it's 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 ego um and it is that thing that we were told by our parents that we were special um and there was this interesting thing and you know i don't know whether my parents will watch this but i noticed the subtle change in rhetoric you know when i got when i got into drama school fantastic how exciting you're doing drama school brilliant and they supported me through that and i'm deeply and eternally grateful for that experience and in those first few years, gosh, it's hard, you know, but again, you know, what can we do to help? Brilliant, fantastic. And by the way, and at no point does that help ever leave, but I think somewhere around my 30th birthday, that rhetoric slightly shifted from, mm. you know, so great to be pursuing your dreams to what are you going to do next? Yeah, wow. That's, um, yeah, and, and, it, and it comes from the most lovely place because they can see the struggle that a creative life entails mm. and they want me to be happy um you know the, there's a whole other question about whether being unhappy makes one happy if you're an artist that, that's a whole different thing but um you know the struggle and the, the sort of poeticness of that existence but no um you know it, it took me a couple of years to, to sort of kind of catch up to them on that style of thinking um because I guess it's taken me a couple of years to get to that question that Jacoby had, which was, you know, what else could you do to be happy? Um, and I've had to find that in a really piecemeal fashion. Mm -hmm. And when I won that competition for the auctioneering, I was doing um, a show called The Pop Up Globe, which was, mm -hmm. um, which is a recreation of Shakespeare's theater, incredible um, scaffold thing. And, and you know, it, it's, it's sort of hard to believe how incredible this, this dismountable Shakespearean globe is, um, but it's a remarkable venue. And, and I, I, was, um, uh, I was a swing in those productions. So I had to go to New Zealand and, and rehearse. And then basically my job was to come and literally be Spear Bear number three. And uh, then, but learn 16 tracks of, of pretty much every other male um, character in, the, in the two shows I was doing, Comedy of Errors and, and um, Macbeth. And so, um, you know, I, that was that first question where that identity thing really kind of came in because I, I won the competition around that time um, and then I was offered the job and there was an argy-bargy with the company as to how much I would do because my idea of the auctioneering was always to support the acting, to make it possible. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, if I did three days a week, including the Saturday, you know, the, a couple of days of prospecting and office work. And, and then the Saturday, how good would that be? I'd have the rest of the week to myself. And they, the auction company would come back and said, no, nope. um, you know, what about, you know, what about what we compromised on was four days a week plus Saturday. So I basically had a flexi day a week that I could take right. to teach a class or to do whatever it was, but it was the, it was the company manager and one of the actors um, in uh, that pop-up globe um, and Katie Shearer, if she had watched this, I'm eternally grateful to her. She, um, you know, when I was sort of piecing through this and saying, gosh, do I take this job, you know, and, and then have a job, you know, and, and would I still be an actor? And, and they both went, for fuck's sake, of course you take the job. We all have to dip in and out of this. Mm. And I suppose what you come around to is the idea that am I always going to be an actor? I think at core... I think I am. I think I speak like, I think like, I, I communicate like, I, 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 I am I am an actor. Am I a professional actor right now? 
arguable. Um, if, uh, you know, if and when Scorsese wants, you know, me to do his next film, um, I'll become an actor again. And uh, my extremely capable business partner might have to do a couple more of the heavy lifting points on, on the bias stuff, you know, and of course I'm being facetious, but the, the, the point is that some way along the way, you have to decide how, what opportunities you choose to chase. You've only got so many hours in the day. Mm. There's only so much, and there's only so much prospecting, again, prospecting, looking for work as an actor does, or looking for clients as a buyer's agent does, or looking for agents who are going to, you know, convince them to hire you as the auctioneer. Um, all of that is prospecting. I see it all in the same boat. And there's only so much that you can do at once. I think, mm. I, feel, I think about it as like a, a vat, you know, and it's full. I've, you know, here I am at the beginning of the week and I've got this much prospecting juice left. And over the course of the week, it just wears down until you cannot possibly cope with another projection. Yeah, yeah. And that's and and then you've got to find a way to fill it back up again somehow. <laughs> so in a way, it's uh, I guess it's a shame that you your other job involves potentially a lot of rejection as well. Well, Probably, it, yeah. you know it, you know it isn't it isn't isn't. But I guess I'm gravitating towards that, and and I, I think a, I think that's a personality trait. Um, what's lovely about the buying agency stuff is that it's constantly the thrill of the chase. Mm-hmm. What you got to do is you, you know, if you think about it, who is meeting buyers ready to buy property more, most often? It's going to be real estate agents, right? Who are selling because they're standing at an open home, opening a door and they're taking names and addresses, right? So, in the initial sense, before you develop a big reputation, as you know, when people start to seek you out, who is going to tell you who you should call as a buyer's agent? Well, it's going to be real estate agents. So you chase them and you build a relationship with them, and you, you know, and you ask them um, for, for, you know, if if there's anybody that we should speak to. So that's a chase. Then you, you know, ch- you make that phone call. It's a more or less a cult call, unless they've given you a good reference or something. And you, you, you convince, you try to convince somebody, persuade somebody that what you do is an important, valuable service. Because, um, unlike in most jobs where, or sales jobs where your greatest competitor is the person you're fighting against, our greatest competitor as buyers agents is the belief that people can and should do it themselves. Mm. Um, so actually, you have to sell a whole concept. So that's a chase. And then you get them into uh, a coffee and then you try to persuade them. And that's a chase. And then you talk about the pricing and the pricing can, you know, can there's some sticker shock involved because, you know, a buyer's agent charges a percentage of the purchase price. And, you know, that starts to look like a pretty big chunk of cash. So that's a chase as well. And then hopefully they sign up and then you start chasing down properties. And then you start chasing down those agents to get you stuff that hasn't even been listed yet that we call off market or pre-market stuff. Mm-hmm. And then you, then you finally, you find the right property and then you've got to, you know, chase down the deal and put the whole thing together and and you know make sure that that your client as the buyer you know is is no knows the value of that property and is is willing and able to pay what it might take to secure it um and then obviously you know that you try to use that relationship with the agent as well to get that organized and get the sale sorted so the whole thing is chase 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 and yeah that's exhausting but and, and so there'd be some people who would think that's a horrendous way of living um, but for me, uh, as an ADD kid, uh, I have ADHD, um, something I only discovered as an adult, actually, mm-hmm. um, that's a personality trait very much tied in with that ADHD people make great business development managers. They, you know, they, mm-hmm. they might've been in, you know, in, in, um, prehistoric times, you know, the, the, the person kind of keeping a, a lookout or something because they're, they're constantly hyper aware and looking for the next challenge. I mean, this is all just nonsense storytelling but pseudo pop science but um pop psychology but the um you know i think one of the challenges um is finding i mean for anybody finding finding uh something that they do with the majority of their time because that's what we do in the way our society is organized it's labor and you you have to you have to spend the majority of your life working so you better try and find something to do that that doesn't make you feel miserable all the time Mm. And you know, nobody's going to like every aspect of their job. And I certainly don't like every aspect of mine, but this is the first time where I'm starting to feel like um, I can do this. I'm suited to this. Um, I have the experience and talent for it. Um, and it is not going to depend what I look like or sound like or um, 
you know, or where I went to school or the color of my skin or anything, that's the, getting the job is not going to depend on those factors. And I know that I'm in terms of, I was well, going to say, interesting that you say that because I was going to say, I would have thought that some of that would have played into because, you know, you're a white middle-class guy with a nice speaking yeah. voice, a good education, all of that, privately educated, all that. Mm you know, is, is there an element of that sort of privilege coming into it that you can like parlay that into this kind of work? 100%. And, you know, I, I, what I was going to go on to say is I know I'm in, I'm in thorny territory there and, and what I want to do, and not just as a point of, of political correctness, but because it's something I believe I am the way that I look and the way that I sound gives me privilege in the world of real estate. Mm. It does. Um, and it, there is something, oh God, I don't, I don't know for whatever, for whatever reason, I think, I think there is a, there's a commonality, you know, that I guess I, I, I and a common language and experience that I share with people with money. I mean, that's mm. a real, that's a reality. I've been in those places, in those circles with those people I've grown up around, um, people who are financially well off and very well off in some cases. Mm. And so, um, so yes, that is, so I guess what I've done is, is moved into an industry where, um, that privilege is, is to my benefit. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things, if, since we're into this territory, um, I, <laughs> I think you're going to laugh at this okay. when Julia Gillard, who was our first female prime minister, as of course you recall, Viv, um, when, she was rolled, as in, you know, the Prime Ministership taken off her again by the, mm-hmm. the guy she had previously rolled, by Kevin Rudd, who came back in to, to uh, sit back in for the Rudd Gillard Rudd government, the <laughs> extraordinary stupidity of Australian politics through the, the, the noughties and early 2010s, yeah. um, as if it is any better now. But anyway, um, when she, I remember being very impacted by something she said, which is that, um, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase her, and I'm sorry, but the, the, the operative point was that, the fact that I was a woman wasn't the whole story, but it wasn't none of the story either. Mm. <clears throat> and I think that's interesting. Um, and I think it's true in her case. Where that sort of egotistically applies to me is that we all come up with stories to define um, and to explain um, failure, I guess. Um, I don't, I I don't quite think my acting career is a failure yet, but it's certainly, you know, kind of by embers. It's, you know, it's, 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 you know, for now, anyway, maybe a a big gust of wind rekindles it, but for now it's embers. Um, I think there has for, for all the right reasons in the last five years or so been a very, very big effort around the world for people to give performance and, you know, um, creative opportunities to people who don't look and sound like me. Mm. Um, and that is not to say there aren't white people on television. There are heaps <laughs> of them, yeah. arguably too many of them. <laughs> I guess to me from where I'm sitting and, and I haven't done a study on it and maybe I'm full of crap. And if somebody wants to pull me up on that, I, I would, would absolutely, absolutely, you know, bow down. But to me, it feels like those for, for emerging artists, those opportunities are, are, are being, you know, the, the people are being advanced in a way um, in order to right historical wrongs. Mm. So the, yes, there are white people on television, but those are people who with established careers. Um, I think had I graduated at another time, perhaps there might've been, a, a, I might've ended up in a, in a different scenario. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't, feel bitter about that I'd like to think I don't um because um I politically I'm 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 really genuinely behind that I'm not just saying that because you know I'm in a public forum here I think it's I think it has been wrong and I think actors of color for example um have had to be five times better than their white compatriots in order to have broken through before Mm. um and that's wrong um and I think that the entire thing needs to write itself but from my perspective, and it is only that, it feels like I like that has swung 
in such a way that I couldn't see a, a space for myself in the industry mm. at the moment. And again, that might change. Mm. Um, and the hardest part is to feel like, like you couldn't hack it. That's it, isn't it? I mean, I wrote a Facebook post to promote a show I was in towards the end of last year. Um, and I recognize just the privilege of just being, having been able to say that. I mean, actors not able to work in, in other parts of the world, of course, but I was doing a show last year. And I thought, and part of what the thrust of that, that post was, was to say, I um, please come and see this show because I'd basically decided that I could use the cover of the pandemic to quietly exit, you know, the industry. Mm. with the story therefore that it was the economy stupid mm. not me mm. not my lack of grit not my lack of determination not my lack of talents not my not my whatever that it would that it wasn't my fault mm. that it was something external that it was a once in a generation fucking pandemic uh, mm. that was responsible and um you know um uh, so I was doing that show and, and I said, you know, please come, this could be my swan song, but I, but also that it could, that it's rekindled that passion and gone, God, I, re I really do want to keep doing this. I mean, I know that I'm happy when I'm on a set or, or in a rehearsal room where great work is being made. And I don't think that'll ever change, but whether or not I need that to be my career hmm. whether or not, I need that to be my, what I, what I do all day or, you know, as much as any actor does anything all day, hmm. um, whether I need that to be my identity um that's the shift that's been the shift in the last six months yeah 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 and I think um in Sydney you know it's it's a much small it's such a different industry from say here where there's this kind of term that I mean I'm sure you you've heard it but I hadn't heard it until I arrived here which is jobbing actor which is like you'll mm. never have seen me in an, in anything but I I'm I'm working it I'm I'm like in the yeah. in things I'm doing stuff all the time but because it's such a, a much bigger environment and network of and market, uh, people have much more opportunity to do that. Whereas in Sydney, it's kind of like you're on a main stage or you're, you know, doing co-op. Yeah, I, yeah, it, I, I only, like, oh, look, every, I think every actor at some point dreams of being a, a superstar. But I would love to have a career where you're that guy. This isn't an original comment, but you know, you know, when you go, oh, that guy, that that woman, yeah. I, I love them. I can't tell you their name, but what do we see them in? They were great. They're always great. Yeah. That guy. I want to be that guy. That's all I wanted. Um, and you know, this is it is it is so entitled, Viv, to say this, but when you leave a drama school like NIDA, you. I, 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 well, I shouldn't speak for everybody. I, I don't speak for myself. I felt like I wasn't necessarily entitled to a career, but fuck me, I was entitled to a shot, mm. a really good shot, a proper go. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I had it mm. or I haven't had it yet anyway. And I made a, I made a short film. Um, I, I wrote it. I, I um, you know, found the director. I, I, you know, I produced it. Um, I put money into it. I crowdfunded it. You know, I made made this thing happen. Um, and for whatever reason, the the when I was going to the um, the release of it was delayed, um, such that it just started to apply for festivals just as COVID hit. Oh. <laughs> you know, just just laxness of history. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, again, I have no idea if that was the kind of thing that would have been different in any other year. But I think it, I think it seems to be that the the story that um, a lot of people finished a lot of projects that were sitting around on the shelf during COVID, and suddenly that's an even more competitive market than it used to be. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> yesterday, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I, you know, I, as I say, I, I, I have, I've worked hard. In, a, in an administrative role and in a self-starter way at this career. Is there more I could have done? Absolutely. But the vat was empty. Mm. And I and there was only so much I could do. Um, but that vat feels a bit more full now because now I can see the rewards for it. Mm. Because, because uh, yes, I'm not doing exactly what I wanted to do, but I found a job that I don't hate that I'm good at and that um, plenty of people have made 
a, a very good living for their family with. Um, and for now, that's that's going to do the trick. And if I can still, from time to time, take a, a, a play with other professionals in a similar boat, and there are plenty of us, and rehearse something that's on, it's going to be on a great stage, the little theatre, you know, the new theatre in Newtown, um, you know, it's going to be, but it's on a Sunday rehearsal and then in the evenings, I can do that. Yeah. And I'm still an actor. Am I, am I still an actor then? You're still an I actor. I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. I don't know. That's, that's, that's my theory. That's where I'm at now. Talk to me in six months' time. I'm probably like, oh, for fuck's sake, fucking buyers, fucking dust. You know, it'll just be a nightmare and, and I'll they'd jump to something else. But, but no, I won't have because um, at some point you've got to stick at it, right? Yeah, definitely. I have a little thing taped somewhere on my desk that says, what does it say? Commitment and then the little is, is greater than symbol ambition. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. work away at things. Yeah. Yep, it does. And um, I've always thrown myself into stuff that's just outside my ability. Mm. And I recognize that as a privilege as well. You know, that this is that, that old anecdote about the, um, that uh, a man looking at a job application, you know, if they're, if they're right for 60% of it, they'll go, great, I'm perfect. And a woman looking at a job application, if they're right for 90% of it, it'd go, ah, oh, that 10%, I could call me, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not going to get it. Yeah. You know, there's, the, there's that thing um, where I, I, I have, I've always just gone, okay, I can do most of this, of what it is, whether it's hosting a trivia night or, you know, or, or doing impro or um, jumping up to, you know, do an auction or the buying stuff, you know, whatever it is, you know, every, there's always something that you start doing. And it's very nice now to just be starting to, to be starting to fill with the real estate stuff. Like I am, like I'm like the imposter syndrome is wearing off. Hmm. So like I've now got, been. yeah, well, just a little bit. And again, probably that's this little healthy dose of ego and arrogance in there too. But, you know, I'm, it, it's taken a while for me to, to go, okay, um, I do know the answer to that. I do have best practice for that. I do have instincts for that. I've seen this scenario before. And so this is what I'm going to do. Um, and I think that that's that's a nice position um, to be in. You've obviously got to have a healthy um, degree of interrogation around that as well, because there's, there's a lot of legal liability apart from anything else when you're doing this stuff. I mean, you, you know, you, it's, it's and that's that's sort of what I kind of like from an ADHD perspective about the auctioning too. That it's such a such an incredible collision of of legal responsibility, performance, best practice, people watching and reading. Um, and then uh, imp like you know, improvising, but semi on script too, because there's legal language that's important. Like it, it is, when I auction, there is no other thing that I'm doing. Mm. My focus is entirely based in that moment. Mm. It's completely consuming. Whereas there are a few other things in my life where, where that's that you're said to be the case. Um, so I guess, you know, finding that is yeah part of, part of the joy it's very rare that people get to do things like that um before we wrap up ollie i wanted to ask you some more um like nuts and bolts questions sure. about money um <clears throat> do you are you a saver do you save no absolutely not <laughs> um no i i always i've always struggled with that um i'm not i'm not in debt mm. um so in a sense, I mean, I have a credit card and most of the time that I, I, I have enough money to pay that off. Um, but again, I've been helped along the way by, by my folks, you know, to, to get to that position. Mm. Um, so, uh, but no, um, I, I think like a lot of creative people, it's, it's so feast and famine that you end up, um, you know, it's, it's, it's shit for so long and then you get a little windfall and then you go and actually live for a bit and then yeah. it's shit again. <laughs> Yeah, totally. It's very, it's very hard. And well, I suppose then loaded question, you know, as a self-employed person, mm. you're legally obliged to, in Australia, uh, in, if you have a job in a company, they're going to, they're 
putting money aside for your retirement as part of your, you know, pay packet, but it's not compulsory if you are uh, self-employed. Are you are you saving for retirement? Yeah. So, um, look, I have some I have money in my super account. Yeah. Um, is it as much as it should be? Uh, you know, well, that's a funny question. I mean, had I worked full time, you know, taking the the education that, that I was given, um, you know, and, and <laughs> gone on. Yeah, sure. There'd be heaps more money in there. I think the, the best way I can answer that question is no. As when I was a straight performer, um, no, there wasn't a lot going in there. I mean, sometimes you'd get a job that compulsively put it in there and that was always good. It was good from a tax withholding perspective too, because, you know, then at least, you know, some bloody tax was being held back. So you weren't completely destroyed at the end of the year. Um, but that has, that's changed now because now there's actually enough money coming in to mm-hmm. live a lifestyle that I'm, that I'm comfortable with to save for a future. And yes, that is the, you know, super and it's going to be a, a much, so that's superannuation to internationalists is um, our retirement fund is going to be a, a much greater priority now. And I think, you know, if somebody was telling me, it's always back of the napkins kind of pub conversations, you know, if you, you, the, you've got to get to $60,000 in your super as quickly as possible. Cause that's when it, you know, it starts to you know, have multiplier effects or, or whatever. And, you know, it, interest on interest and all the rest of it, but um, I'm not there yet but um, I'm working on it. Um, what financial mistakes have you made? Mistakes. Hmm. Have you made financial mistakes? I have a, again, I, I am a very lucky boy to have a financial safety net mm. in, some, in, in some family money. Um, and that's allowed me to take risks um, that I think would have been big mistakes had I not had that safety net. Hmm. So um, I don't think I have made any, but that's not down to my in- talent or objective you know, abil- ability with it. That's that's down to just the, the the luck and happenstance of my birth. Yeah, sure, fair enough. I mean, it's all it's all um, very contingent. <laughs> that kind of question. Mm, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Um, do you have any money hang-ups yeah um, I think and and it's appalling to say this but um, there is a big part of me that still believes is the responsibility of the, the man in the relationship to bring in the money interesting interesting and my politics are so completely against that, but it's, but you know, it's, it's funny. I, I've asked that question honestly, because that was the first thing that hit when you asked me the question. So I thought, well, it's for interest sake, it lives there. Yeah. I, you know, I am, um, I'm not backtracking. I, I know that's a thing that I think, but it's not something that I, I think I, I want to think, but that being said, um, that is how I'm setting up my life hmm. that, that I, I'm, that I'm, that I'm putting aside a, a creative career, um, Partly because you know um, my partner is brilliant with kids, and and I don't have any real experience with them. So I mean, I'm sure that the the burden of of if we if and when we you know can hopefully can choose to start a family that you know that that um, that she will be driving that, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, and therefore that I'll be driving the other thing. Um, is it a coincidence that it's gendered? Maybe, probably not. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think probably not. <laughs> Does that um it, it was that the blueprint that you grew up with then? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um and um yeah, and I, and I, you know that's that's a, a, a lot of what we end up believing is is you know oh. what you were surrounded by and it wasn't just my parents it was um all, all my friends parents almost. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was a culture. Mm. Um yeah. yeah. I think I think uh, being aware of it is is you know a very large percentage of the way to to sort of addressing it like in your mm. in your own life you know with your kids you might talk about these gender stereotypes and you would probably they would have friends who had different kinds of families and different ways of you know managing all those things so you know they might be exposed to a little bit more 
Right. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and, and, and hopefully, um, yeah, I mean, that's certainly something that, that's important to me. I mean, uh, my, my personal politics have, have flipped completely from when you first met me to, uh, you know, to where they live today. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you know, which is. Uh, you love to see it, Ollie, as the kids well, say on the internet. <laughs> well, you know. Um, yeah, it was that was and that was a function of getting out of that culture of just, you know, where, where everybody lived the same, had more or less the same, um, thought more or less the same, and then arriving I and mean, not like Sydney Uni is, you know, is is a a, a bastion of um, you know, kind of working class melting pot and you you know it's still a very rarefied kind of a, a college mm. but at least I started to meet some people who you know hadn't been to private school yeah um <laughs> and and suddenly all of the things that I'd been told you know like I mean the classic one that just world theory that you know people get what they deserve and hard work gets you you know results and all the rest of it and you know, so, as soon as meeting people um who for whom that did, hadn't held true I, it suddenly to to cleave to conservative politics never made sense to me anymore Mm. anyway that's a whole other story oh i know well we could we could probably keep on having this chat for sure. a very long time but i am aware that one i was late and uh two <laughs> okay. just getting on for your saturday evening um thank you so much ollie it's been a real pleasure oh thank you viv it's it's delightful it's lovely to see you and um and thank you i mean thank you for letting me talk about myself for, for however long this has been <laughs> what up does love right oh absolutely <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to the Artists Make Money podcast. You can find us on Instagram at Artists Make Money, where you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter. You can find me on Twitter at VivEgan41, and you can find Oliver on Instagram at Ollie Burton Official. That's O L I B U R T O N Official. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really love it if you could follow, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts and share it with a friend. The theme music for this show was composed by Tiva. That's T-I-I-V-A. You can check them out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Spotify. Being an artist is hard and making a living from it is even harder, but I believe in you. Keep going.